Good evening and a very warm welcome to the sixth Wednesday webinar that Wells Oz Welfare are organising. You are kindly joining us by Zoom and you're very welcome. Um, we're just going to mark time a little bit uh, until we get uh, are also joined by those joining us by Facebook Live. Uh, tonight's webinar is the second one we are running on equine weight management. Uh, as I said, this is the sixth um, webinar we've been running. We've covered a variety of topics, including fitness, uh, protecting our horses from disease, a first um, webinar around weight management, uh, one about responsible worming, most recently around transporting our horses and how to protect them um, whilst we transport them before and after and this evening is as I say the second one on uh, weight management. Um, we do you, you are joining us on zoom and the good news about joining us on zoom is that we've got a couple of poll questions during the evening. Uh, you'll be able to do that um, to, to get involved with those poll questions. Um, we'll now do a second start because I'm delighted to be joined by uh, for our, our sixth Wednesday webinar with our Facebook live viewers. So a very warm welcome to tonight's webinar uh, where I'm delighted that we're uh, joined once again by Dr. Teresa Hollands from the University of, of Surrey and also our very own Sarah German who's the Assistant Centre Manager at our Somerset Farm, uh, Glenda Spooner Farm. Uh, rescue and rehoming center so as i mentioned earlier this is a second of uh, a webinar on weight management um and we really want you to get to get involved so if you are what, with us on facebook live then please do share the video please do remember that we do record these videos uh, these webinars so if uh, you enjoy it then please tell your friends and family about them but also if you have topics we're looking to run these webinars during the course of the remainder of the year every fortnight so if you've got topics you'd like us to cover then please do let us know uh, by emailing us at education at worldhorsewelfare.org during the course of the evening we've got two presentations and then we've got time for q a so do start sending your questions in i'm delighted to say we've had a few questions already if you're on facebook live then please do that through the comment section and if you're watching us on zoom then please do that uh, through the Q&A function or indeed the chat function. Now before I um, introduce you to, um, to, to Teresa, we are going to have a first of our poll questions. So um, if you can just wait one whilst I try and get that going. Um, there you go, I'm telling you, um, uh, let's see if I can share that. Um, we seem to have got a poll question coming up already, so I don't want to do that yet. Um, here we go. Right. So um, this evening, the first poll question we're going to ask you is, do you normally weigh your horse's daily hay or haylage ration? Now, there are six options here. Uh, please uh, don't worry. This is not a test. We just want to get a feel for um, what people do currently who are joining us this evening. So whilst you're answering that question, um, I thought I'd just do, do a very short introduction of World Horse Welfare. I apologise if you've been joining us for six when, well, Wednesday webinars, you can probably do this introduction better than me. But World Horse Welfare, it was founded and very much at the heart of what we do is supporting the horse-human partnership. Uh, we support the responsible, view, horses, responsible use of horses in sport and we run the largest equine rescue and rehoming scheme in, in, in Britain. And we, uh, we work through um, hands-on care, promoting research, um, shaping laws, uh, raising welfare standards, uh, and especially um, through education, which is what these Wednesday webinars are all about. Now, as I mentioned tonight, it's about uh, managing weight. And we know that weight is a really contentious issue, not just for our horses, but for our pets and for people too. And what we're not looking to do tonight at all is to, to fat shame or to say people are bad owners if they have horses that are overweight. We want to try and share our experiences with you so we as horse owners can do a better job at managing our horse's weight because we certainly recognise at World Tours Welfare that this is a very challenging area. Now, this is a second um, a webinar around what we would say the good doer but we're also going to do um, a webinar around the poor doer later in the year as well. 
for World Horse Welfare, horses come into our centres in all, in all shapes and sizes. And we know that some horses literally look at grass um, and will put on weight. So it is a very challenging area. And I'm delighted that Theresa is, is going to look at what we can do and why, why we should do these actions in managing our horses' weight. And then Sarah is going to say what and how we can uh, do, uh, make some practical changes to weight that we chat. Uh, we manage our horses to maintain uh, at their weight. So we recognise there is an e epidemic of equine obesity. So it's a really, really important area. Before I hand you over to Teresa, I'm going to ask you to uh, ask Jamie if we can have an answer to the poll question to see what kind of um, responses we've got. I'm not sure if that's possible, Jamie. You might be having a trouble. Oh, no, here we go. Excellent. So as ever, we've got a, a range, um, but narrowly, um, we've got no, but I know roughly how much I'm, I'm feeding. And, but, and that's narrowly beaten by, yes, I use scales and weigh uh, my ration amount daily. So that's a good and, and a spread from the, oh, no, sorry, I misread one because down the bottom, no, I feed my hoard ad lib forage. So we've got a very good split actually um, across there. So that's a, a good sort of introduction to, to Teresa. So I'll now introduce you to Teresa in many ways, especially if you're listening to our first webinar, you will know so, so much about Teresa anyway. She's a great friend of the charity, was instrumental along with, um, with Sam Chubbuck, who spoke to, uh, in our first webinar on the Right Weight Initiative that World Horse Welfare has been running for, for many years. Um, Teresa was initially qualified uh, as a general um, sort of practitioner of uh, a nutritionist, worked within the small animal sector and the farm animal sector, ha had a, a long period at Dodson and Horrell before moving a few years ago to the University of Surrey. Um, and uh, Teresa, I found out this evening because I was just doing a little bit of research. It was a part of it, we led the equine nutrition team that advised the Team GB leading up to and after London 2012. So she clearly did a pretty good job. So, Teresa, over to you. Thank you, Rowley. So, I've just unmuted myself and now I'll share my screen. And hopefully, you can see my screen. Oh, no, I need to share it first. That helps, doesn't it? So hopefully you can see that now and I'll just put it on slideshow for you. Okay, um, so hello everyone. Yes, so we're going to look um, this evening at, at healthy feeding, which hopefully you apply to all sorts of horses, regardless of the type that you might have. Um, and although the emphasis is on those horses that might be at risk of overweight, so what I wanted to do is look at um, hard feed versus grass. So what is it that's causing our horses to be at um, have an increased risk of over being overweight from a feeding point of view and then think about calories and energy and then having done that we've got sort of like a four step plan on what we want to cover to look at the evidence behind um, <clears throat> excuse me what may or may not work so we're going to look at controlling calories and um, thinking about maintaining bulk so horses have to eat think about how we can make sure they're being fed the right sort of nutrition and then also um, taking on board and accepting the fact that this is a lifetime change. So what we do know is that, and this seems a bit um, contrary to what you might expect, I suppose, is that higher fat scores are associated with the absence of feeding concentrates. So in other words, horses that are fed concentrates normally have lower fat scores compared to horses that don't. And actually, we know that, and the evidence shows that, and I'll explain to you why. You can see here, this is the percentage of horses, and then we've got our different groups here. And the green is um, less than one scoop of hard feed. So we're, we're doing it right because 90% of our um, overweight horses, our obese and our fat ones between them, are being fed less than one scoop of hard feed. And you tell us that, and you say, I don't feed him, or you might not, but I'm sure you've heard people say this, I don't feed him, he lives on fresh air. So I thought it would be worth just stepping back a minute and thinking about what we mean by that in terms of fresh air. So this is our typical 250 kilo pony, it's out 24 hours a day. And if he's out for 24 hours a day, then grass will simply be providing them with excess calories. And I think we all know that this is quite frustrating trying to restrict grazing. So this is our 100% of requirements. And the red here is how many calories this pony is getting 
if it's eating two and a half percent of its body weight as grass. So nearly, but not quite, 200 um, or twice the amount of calories that they actually need. What they are also um, deficient in are vitamins and minerals though, despite the fact that they're getting nearly twice the number of calories they need. So let's think about this fresh air and uh, sad that I am, I went out and weighed out a scoop of fresh grass and it weighs about half a kilo. So if I think that this little pony is out um, 16 out of 24 hours, or actually it's out 24 hours a day, I said, didn't I? So eating 16 out of those 24 hours, this pony is able to eat 2.5% of its body weight. So that means, as it's dry matter, this is how much dry matter grass that they can eat. But then we've got to add the water back in. So your pony can actually eat 41 kilograms of fresh grass in a day. So in an hour, he's eating five scoops of fresh grass. So that's 85 scoops of this grass in 16 hours. Ain't fresh air. The scariest thing is, this is some work that we did at World Horse Welfare while I was still at Dunstan Horrell with um, Naples University. We actually measured how much grass horses ate because believe it or not we didn't know we just had this average and what we found was is the average horse was eating about three or nearly four percent of their body weight as grass and I'm sure you've all got some of these at home so some of them were eating five percent of their body weight um, and even those that weren't particularly greedy were still eating three percent of their body weight as grass so more than that two and a half percent so I thought, right, okay, let's um, put this pony up to 4% of its body weight, which means they're going to be eating 100 scoops in 16 hours. And this is how many calories, horse calories, that pony will be eating. So I converted that into human calories, and then I divided it by that pony's body weight to see how many calories they were eating per kilo body weight. And then I multiplied that by my own body weight. So that meant that if I was going to eat as much as this pony was getting from grass, I would be eating between five and nearly 7,000 kilocalories or calories a day. And so I searched on the internet to find out something that's around 5,000 calories. And this is the total amount of food myself would eat to give myself the human equivalent of what this pony has been getting out of grass. Just thought it was interesting. So that's something I think we need to put in the back of our heads and remember. And then the other thing I think that we perhaps need to think about is the words we use when we talk to each other. And if we think about feeding for energy, so often we used to get on the helpline a call from people that may have a, a show cob in show condition, and you're needing a little bit more energy. So you say, you know, what can I feed my horse to give him a bit more energy? He needs more pet. Or on the other hand, you may have a fit young um, show jumper just not moving off your leg well enough and so you want to give them a bit more energy you want to know what sort of food you can feed and that's quite a challenge for us as nutritionists because we're actually using the word energy colloquially when you ask for that so if you think about it you know I'm tired it's the end of the day um, and that's what I mean when I say I need more energy I tend to feel weary and I think that's what we equate with our horses and um, often we think well if I have something to eat, that will give me more energy, even if I've eaten all the food I need for the day, for instance. Whereas if we think of the word calorie, then in everyday language, we use that to count, don't we? We, we think about how fattening the food is, so it gives us an idea of how many calories we can eat to, uh, in a day in order to maintain our body weight. But actually, scientifically, we call the food we eat, we measure the food we eat, the intake is energy. So it's how our bodies break down the food we eat into cell energy for us to live and, and you know, reproduce and, and you know, hair grows long during lockdown and that sort of thing. But we measure that energy in calories. And there's different ways in which we measure it, as you can see from this slide here. And this is how we measure our horse's energy and digestible energy. So if we think of it in that point of view, and we equate this, it's difficult sometimes to think of it in, in horse terms always, so if we think it in human terms, it's clear that um, this individual here and this individual here, if they're going to do a marathon, for instance, actually doesn't need to eat any more energy. In fact, they probably need less calories. 
So these horses actually don't need any more energy for them to do the jobs they need. They, they, they've already got enough energy from the food that they're eating. So I think that um, when we're trying to get our heads around what we want to feed our horses, it's be better if we use the word calories to substitute that word energy with the word calories. And so we measure our horses' energy, chemical energy intake or food intake in megajoules, whereas we measure our own energy intake in kilo cows, which you and I tend to call calories. So that's two sort of things I just wanted to get out of the way before we started looking at our, our four-step plan um, for healthy feeding. And as I said, we're going to look at controlling calories, maintaining bulk, looking at how we can make sure our horse is getting enough nutrients, and then thinking about lifetime management of these horses. Why do we have to control calories? Well, I think, you know, everyone knows this really. It's the only way to reduce fat. And we also know that as fat is lost, as we talked about last time, then insulin resistance is reduced. So if we can control calories, we reduce the insulin resistance, we reduce the chronic inflammation, and our horses are healthy as a result. And clearly for most of our horses, the best way to control calories is to restrict their grazing. And um, fortunately for our horses in the UK, most of them do go out for a period of time and that's to be encouraged. So some work that was done by um, Jo Ireland in Liverpool, she found that um, most of us turn our horses out during the winter, 73% of us during the day. And, these, and our horses in the winter spend about eight hours playing out. But in the spring and summer, um, over 80% of us turn our horses out. And in fact, 50% of the horses during the summer are turned out for um, 24 hours a day. And that brings a bit of a challenge because as we've already stated, grass provides excess calories. So the best way to stop our horses eating fresh air is to restrict grazing. So you can see here, if we, um, we can still have them out 24 hours, but this is on poor pasture. So this is their 100% of requirements along the top here. Oh, sorry, to me. Along the top here. And you can see straight away that by restricting the um, quantity and the calories in the grass, we've reduced their energy intake, or calorie intake, um, to 80% of requirements, so they'll start to lose weight. We still have a, a problem with vitamins and minerals, uh, or minerals here, which we'll address in a bit. So, okay, how are we going to um, restrict this grass? How much space do our horses need? Well, I suspect that most of you know that the British Horse Society tell us that um, our horses need about um, a hectare for two horses, so one to one and a half acres per individual horse. And they say that's a minimum acreage requirement for the average horse on grazing. Okay, um, But what they do say is that the acreage required obviously depends on the type of horse you've got, how much work they're doing, and grazing quality and pasture management. <laughs> so clearly um, it depends on the time of the year to start with as to how much space we're going to give our horses and therefore how much grass they need. So along the top here, this is the energy or calories, which is probably the bit that we just want to think about. So clearly, as we all know, as horse owners, in the winter, there's normally not enough calories in the grass. In the autumn, it may well just meet what they need. But in the summer and the spring, and it's going to provide them, this is only for about 24 hours a day, with excess calories. So we need to take that into account. And I think also what we need to think about is particularly with climate change as it is and with the seasons all back to front, we can't automatically assume that winter is not going to provide too many calories in terms of grass. So what we, we did, um, this was some research that we were doing, if we're going to take on board that we need, we're allowed to put two horses on per hectare, what we do is we throw quad rats out across the field that, weigh, uh, that measure a metre squared. We cut the grass in those quad rats and then we, we use Google Maps um, to work out the total space in that field. We weigh out the amount of grass in those quad rats and then we multiply them up by the total space there. So in this particular field here, we had 93 grams in um, one metre squared. And in this one, same time of the year, we had 300 grams. Squared. Times that up to just hypothetical because the field wasn't this big, but I just thought it'd be interesting. So, this field, our horses potentially can eat 230 kilos of grass. In this one, 3,000 kilos of grass. And this is what we saw here. These are 
four fields we were looking at and plotting, October and November. And these, this field and this field did what we expected as the, we went into winter, the amount of grass decreased. This field, it went up. And actually what we were finding to weighing the horses is that these horses were putting on 3% of their body weight per week. So obviously, you know, it's, we've got to take all these sorts of things into account. The other thing I suspect you've all heard about is um, restricting grazing, um, particularly in terms of muzzles. And um, the research papers show us that if we restrict grazing um, to a short period of time, then our horses seem to compensate. So maybe this advice isn't quite as good as we think, but let me just go through this graph, graph with you. This is the work that um, these guys published. So along the bottom here, we've got the amount of time our horses, those horses were spending grazing. And this is how much grass they ate per hour. So in, in, um, per hour, if they're only out for three hours, they're eating two kilos um, per kilo body weight. So two kilos of grass for every kilo body weight they are. Whereas if they're out for 24 hours, their intake's a lot slower. They're only eating just, um, well, just over half a kilo um, every hour. Okay? But the important thing is, which doesn't always get reported, is these horses, work, particularly these ones here, were not left without food for the rest of the time. They were provided with hay watch. Regardless of the time grazing, all the groups made up the difference. So in the end, they were eating about 2% of their body weight um, over those six weeks. So the difference was made up by the haylage. So the important thing is, is if we are going to restrict our horses for a short period of time, they can't overeat because you're, only, you're restricting it. But when you do give them something as a grass replacer, that something's got to be low in calories. And it is, as you know, we bring them in is the other option to restricting grazing, but it's very difficult for anybody to lose um, weight when they're in bed. And we do also need to remember that horses that are out stay as fit as if they're being exercised. So the, the, the evidence is you should still turn out with a muzzle, but be aware that if you replace that grass with something that's equally high in calories, then you've still got that challenge. So replace it with something that's low in calorie, calories. Or cut the grass or put more horses on the field. So how much grass is too little or too much? Well, as I said to you, we, we throw these quadrats out, but the easiest way for, for you to do it is to take a plastic carrier bag, which we shouldn't have anymore, a pair of scissors, um, and if it takes you between half an hour to an hour to fill that carrier bag, then your horses have got about the right amount of grazing. No, sorry, what am I talking about? <laughs> too much grass, beg your pardon. If it takes you over two hours to fill that carrier bag, then your horses probably have about the right amount of grazing. The other way you can double check is to um, poop it. So weigh, weigh the droppings because your horses should be producing between 1% to 3% of their body weight as, as equal output. If it's less than 1%, you've reduced the grass too much. Um, if it's a, above 3%, then they're going to be eating too much. And clearly they can't poo if they're not eating. So they clearly are eating enough. Second thing we need to think about is um, to maintain bulk because as you know if we reduce the amount of forage our horses eat we have a welfare um, issue and actually producing um, forage doesn't always reduce calories. So the research and there's lots of papers but as you know you're more likely to have your horses chew wood, you're more likely to get them getting gastric ulcers um, and they're more likely to get colics if you reduce the forage too much. So we need to think about that. And the other thing they're more likely to do is because our horses have both a physical need and physiological need but also psychological need to chew and, and this was some work where they um, successfully got horses to lose weight by reducing their forage intake to one and a half percent of their body weight but these ponies were <laughs> hungry so they actually ate um, up to three kilos of wood shavings a day as um, to compensate for the lack of forage in their diets and I think what we need to remember is that if we restrict our horses natural eating behavior it's actually stressful in terms of the biology of their digestive system. And if we restrict calories, um, both ourselves and other animals, it stimulates cortisol re um, release. So if we're restricting our overweight horses, then we're going to increase their cortisol. We're also going to increase their risk of stereotypies. 
and stereotypy in turn is also associated with an increase in cortisol. Cortisol has um, a link to insulin resistance, so it all starts getting a little bit complicated. And as you know, insulin resistance is linked to the very things we're trying to avoid, so it's linked to acrylometabolic syndrome. And there's been some paper that, so those, some of those things I put up weren't um, specific to horses, but there's been a paper published recently which looked at this specifically with our horses. And, and what they found was that withholding food, particularly to horses with equine metabolic syndrome, actually decreased their insulin sensitivities. In other words, it made them more insulin resistant. So restricting their food is actually the opposite of what we ought to be doing particularly because, depending on what you were feeding in the first place, restricting that bulk doesn't always control calories as much as you might think. So here we've got a table, sorry, but this is a horse that's restricted to one and a half percent of their body weight, so that's why all of this is the same, so this is what we call a dry matter. This is the amount of energy they get from it, but at the end of the day, this is the bit that we're interested in. So if your horse is out on um, winter pasture, they're going to get 74% of their calorie requirement. But if, in, if, oh, sorry, if for instance, they were on high fiber haylage and you reduce that to 1.5% of their body weight, they're still going to get more calories than they need. But then they've got all the other things to worry about. So it's really important that you can count calories. And again, I did this for myself. So this was one and a half percent of my body weight. So I can eat 900 grams of these various types of, of food. And you can see it makes a massive difference to the number of calories that um, I'm eating. So count calories, don't reduce the total quantity of food. How do we do that? Well, the first thing you need to do really is probably get your hay analyzed so that you know what we're starting with. And this, this is just a whole load of numbers here, but it really just shows you um, the sort of results that you will get from analysis, Oops, sorry. Um, and this is the amount of sugar that we're worried about here. So most of the hays in this country are below, are relatively low in, in sugar, and therefore are reasonably low in calories. But if we soak our hay, then we can be very certain that we're reducing the calories in our horses' um, hay, and that will mean that they can eat more of it because we've reduced the amount of calories that were there in the first place. So this was some um, work that was done looking at exactly how many calories or how, many, how much sugar were being lost from the hay. So this hay was really high, it was nearly 20% on sugars, water soluble carbohydrate. And what they found was depending on how long the hay was soaked, obviously as the longer it was soaked, the more calories were being lost. So after 16 hours, 42% of the um, calories were lost. What does that mean? That means that we've actually lost 20% of the calories from that hay, which is the equivalent of 91 teaspoons of sugar. So um, that's the equivalent of 743 human calories if we fed that horse 10 kilos of hay a day. So it is definitely worth soaking hay. And actually, by soaking hay, you can see this is hay at the bottom here you can see that then we really reduce the way our horse's insulin reacts to whatever sugar might be left. So soaking hay is, is, is definitely something you should be thinking about. Something that you may have asked about or read about is, okay, well, I soak hay, but what about the bacteria? I've read somewhere that we, we, might, we need to be worried about bacteria because it increases with soaking. Well, the research was a little bit naughty. This was the first study. And what they did is they took a bet, some bales of hay, they steamed half for 40 minutes, and then they divided the other half into two hay nets. One was kept dry, and the other was soaked for 10 minutes. So it wasn't even the same amount of time as it was steamed, and then they drained it for 10 minutes. So, so yeah, there was quite a lot of bacteria still left on it because it hadn't been soaked for very long. So another group of people went on and did the work in more depth, and they actually soaked it between the hours that we're more likely to do. And what they found was after 16 hours, there was actually no difference between the amount of bacteria on the soaked hay and the dry hay, although the proportion changed. So please don't let that put you off soaking hay because it's perfectly safe. As far as we know at the moment, science might change, but at the moment it's perfectly safe. The other thing we can do, of course, is um, slow the amount of time that our horses spend eating. So we soak the hay and we put hay into small hole hay nets or, or use different apparatuses like we have here. 
if you've soaked hay and you still find that your horse isn't losing um, fat, then consider straw, not wheat straw, because that's really high in silica. Um, and then there's certain things you need to think about. So check your horses can chew well, um, make sure they're drinking enough and introduce slowly. Again, there was some work that was done that showed that um, feeding straw was um, linked to an increased likelihood of gastric ulcers when straw was the only forage provided. When you actually read that paper in a little bit more detail, these horses had access to straw from their bedding without any other forage. So it may well be they just simply weren't eating enough and they weren't producing enough saliva. Um, oops, sorry, keep doing this, sorry. Um, and when you read further into the, the paper, they did tell you how much hay these different horses were on, but they didn't actually say how much straw was being fed. So I think that um, one, one should take that with caution. And there has been a more recent paper that's looked at feeding horses and ponies over the, or ponies actually, over a, a winter for six months, I think it was. And um, basically what they found was is that the horses that were ponies that were being hay fed, this is um, body weight, this is negative, so weight loss, which is what we're after, and this is weight gain. Those horses that were being fed a mixture of hay and straw didn't really lose weight. Those that were on the 50-50 mixture were losing weight. There was no colic, no laminitis, um, and no, no gastric ulceration. So feeding straw is a really useful alternative um, to feeding hay if your horses aren't losing weight on um, soaked hay. And then finally, we need to think about feeding for optimal nutrition because um, when we soak hay, we lose minerals from unsoaked hay. This is that this is soaked for 12 hours. We get a reduction in minerals that's in our hay. We know there's not enough minerals in grazing, and this just shows you all the red is the um, deficiencies in minerals in feeding our blood soaked hay. So the sort of things that you probably want to be thinking about is um, feeding a feed balancer. So you feed 100 grams per 100 kilo body weight because most of our horses, if they are being overfed, they're overfed calories, but they're undernourished. And it's really, really important that you feed, provide them with vitamin and minerals because and then there's an imbalance in micronutrients in the human nutrition literature that is associated with um, human obesity. It seems to increase the risk. And then, although I said that was fine, and I think I've just run over again, I'm really sorry, Roly, I did last time, didn't I? Is that I do think it's really important we don't use the word diet because it's a four letter word, especially for us ladies. We're not putting our horses on a diet, we're supporting them for life in conjunction with exercise. And the best time to do it, which is why this, although I don't like to think about winter, is now, from now on in, through to the autumn and through the winter. And we want to lose fat on our horses through the winter. Exercise, half an hour a day, is, uh, this, at the rate at which you think you miss the bus, you know, so you've got to walk fast with the horse um, and get its heart rate up to 80 beats a minute. Turn them out every day. And maybe, I think Sarah's going to talk to us about this. Forget the rugs, maybe. They've got their own insulation, otherwise this would melt. And winter turnout, you know, exercise maintains muscle. And just as a really quick reminder, this is a amount of exercise our horses do if they're kept in the stable. This is what they would be doing if they're out in the wild. Let's emanate that. We need them to keep them moving. Fat loss in the winter is great. This is the annual weight loss of wild ponies. So this is summer weight, this is winter weight. They lose 8% of their body weight in the winter. Most of that is from fat. So let's translate that to a 500 kilo horse. That's 40 kilos of fat loss through the winter. If we're not riding them, we don't want them looking good when they come out of the winter. We want them to lose fat, okay? And the greatest risk of our horses being overweight is being on a yard of fat horses because we, we normalise it. So it is really important that we can recognise fatness and, and recognise when our horses are losing that fat through the winter. And we do that by fat scoring. And again, um, Sarah's going to talk to, this, talk to us about this um, when she tells us what they do um, down in Somerset. Um, we talked about this last time, Sam did, but that was just up there, just to remind you how we do our fat scoring. And I just want to finish with um, practical principles really, the ABC. So we should always balance our vitamins and minerals 
You should always control calories, exercise daily as much as possible, fat score fortnightly, give bulk, I couldn't think of another G. Um, have patience, it will take two years at least. Um, instigate winter weight loss and join up with friends at the moment, socially distanced so we can support each other and write it down. And that's me finished, thank you Rowley. Brilliant, Teresa. Thank you so much. I love the way on that ABC you've you've missed out D. So that, is that because you, we shouldn't be saying diet? I assume is is because <laughs> I can't spell. <laughs> excellent. That's excellent. Um, I'll get one in there. Yeah, don't diet would work well. I, I'll do that okay. next time. I'll put in a D there. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> okay, well done. Thank you so much. And you know, as I said earlier, the, the, Teresa talked about the what and why, and um, and Sarah shortly going to be talking about the what and how. Now, before I, I do apologise, you would think after six weeks of doing this, I would know what I'm doing, but you've clearly worked because I didn't actually show you the slides last time, that I haven't got a clue, uh, which I, I'm I'm sorry about that. Um, now, I think that is the right button to press. Let me just, just see if I can get that. No, that's no. Let's go slideshow. I'm gonna from current slide. Here we go. So eventually I get there. So I've already introduced you to Teresa, but before I introduce you to Sarah, I want to ask you another question. Again, there's no right and wrong answers here, but have you ever had a soil, grass and or hay analysis carried out? Now there's six options there, three around yes, three around no. Uh, if you could just take a moment to fill that in. And whilst you're doing that, um, uh, they're, they're the poll um, options and I apologise if you're on Facebook Live you won't be able to uh, join us uh, in the poll so next time do join us by Zoom but I'm really pleased to introduce Zara uh, German been our, at Glenderspooner Farm our rescue and rehoming centre in Somerset since 2009 and is now our assistant centre manager at Glenderspooner Farm and she has a really important job there because she's our rehoming coordinator and um, I've talked to previously about these webinars the importance of the work that World Horse Welfare and the other charities do in rehoming horses that have suffered abuse and neglect and especially at a time like this when we we have great fears that coming into the winter time we are going to have significant calls on our services due to the number of animals that potentially will be in need of, of, of emergency care and therefore rehoming from World Horse Welfare and the other charities is such an important way uh, of helping us do our work so why buy when you can re when you can rehome is such an important message for us but Zara um, is uh, as I said been with us over 11 years but she's not all about the horses because she is a human holistic massage therapist and an equine shih tzu practitioner as well and to enjoy, uh, I'll read this out, to enjoy, to relax, she enjoys yoga and finds this indispensable to cope with all the aches and pains of getting older, especially in the winter months, having spent endless days in the pouring rain. <laughs> Well, w welcome to working for World Horse Welfare. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand over to you. Thank you very much, Roly. Just get my presentation up. Uh, oh, should be up now. There we go. Okay, um, so I'm going to echo a little bit about what Teresa said, but looking a little bit more on the practical side of it. Um, so um, there are uh, many variables when it comes to looking at weight management, and there are also many ways in which we can address issues um, that arise, or better still, understand um, the needs of a particular equine before we make the decision to take on that horse or pony. So we'll look a little bit at breed versus grading need, grazing needs, um, ways that we can manage grazing, forage and supplementary feeding, um, looking at exercise dependent on your individual horse's abilities, seasonal weight management, body condition scoring and weigh weighing, and then at the end, just um, a short case study of one of our horses. So looking at um, breed versus grazing needs, um, if you've got a 16 hand horse, sort of thoroughbred type, is going to have very differing grazing management to that of a Shetland pony or a cob. Um, and this will vary quite a lot. Many people think that by taking on a small pony as a companion um, to a thoroughbred type, for example, um, it will be an easy option because of its size. Um, this, however, is rarely the case. Um, what we have to remember is that native ponies 
in particular are bred to put on weight in the summer. Um, they put on as much as possible uh, because in their natural environment in the mountains and moorland, they'll lose that weight surviving the winter months. Um, nowadays, much of our grazing is richer um, than the, they would find in these environments due to the choices that we have of grass seed, fertilizer, and the field management, which many of us use to rightly protect and um, prolong our grazing. Um, this is why we so often see issues with weight and other medical conditions associated with ponies, um, particularly the ones that we call good doers. Uh, we also recognise that these good doers are often a popular choice of horse or pony for many people due to their intelligence, their stoic nature and their hardiness. Um, so ideally, before making the choice of the type of horse you, you'd love to have or you think you need, really have a think about how you're going to be able to manage its lifestyle, um, in particular its grazing regime. Um, there are going to be times when um, there might not be the luxury of this choice because of location restrictions, cost or other factors. But what should be foremost in our minds is the quality of life for that particular equine and meeting uh, one of its basic care needs, which is obviously weight management. Um, at our centres, we are seeing more and more equines coming into our care, obese, with body condition scores of four and above, and you'll see the impact of this um, in the case study I'll talk about at the end. So questions to ask yourself are, how much grazing does my horse or pony need in relation to its breed and its type and its age? What type of grazing do I have access to? Am I able to adapt this if I need to? And am I able to exercise my horse or pony to help with the weight management? So as Teresa said, a sort of a rule of thumb is around sort of one to one and a half acres per horse and then normally an acre-ish um, for extra horses from there. But this is going to vary. Um, it's going to be very variable for breed types um, and other factors like the size of your pony, the type of grazing and the state of the grazing at the time. So do you know um, what the grazing was used for previously? Um, do you know what sort of nutritional value it has now? Um, a soil and grazing analysis, as Teresa said, is a really useful process to find out this information. Um, what type of soil do you have? Do you have sandy soil or do you have something like clay? Um, sandy soil is great for drainage, but um, you have the danger of horses ingesting the sand if the grass is too short, um, which is obviously not going to be good for so much for horses on a weight management program. Whereas clay soil bases, um, they don't drain so well, but you can graze them down more. Um, you'll find that um, at Glenderspooner Farm, we have a clay soil so although it's very very wet in the winter we can um, as you can see in the picture let the grazing go right down whereas at Hall Farm in Norfolk they have sandy soil so they have to really think about the length of their grazing and look at alternative ways um, to graze their ponies which I'll go on to in a moment. So looking at alternative ways that we can manage our grazing we've got small paddocks um, which are really useful for controlling the weight of a smaller pony and ideal if you have several of them that you can rest and rotate. Um, however, these do restrict equine movement, which is important in maintaining weight loss. And we have to also look at the importance of mental well-being for the ponies as well as physical. So strip grazing can be a better way of doing this um, as not only is it controlling the amount they eat, it's encouraging more movement than in a small paddock. And if you've got electric fencing, you can move the post little by little. Um, and you can also move it from the other side so that you can save your pasture um, and rest it. Um, it's also a really good way of introducing horses onto new pasture without overloading the horse's system with new grass and then having the danger of laminitis, weight gain or colic. Uh, always remember that when you've got a sort of strip grazing, you've got enough space for your, each of the horses to get out of their, each other's way so that you avoid confrontation and bullying. Um, and don't forget with these types of methods that you do need to provide some kind of shelter from the elements um, or be able to bring the horse into a stable if you need to. Um, we, we have around sort of 180, 200 acres of fields at Glenderspooner Farm. Um, 
we have also have between sort of 70 and 100 horses at any time so we're always having to move our horses about we do have these small paddocks we do use strip grazing we have larger fields where we can sort of have herds of horses but it's a it, we're forever sort of checking the horses every week to look at um, fat scoring and weight management and looking at the grazing they're on so um, a new type of system or something that's becoming more popular now are track systems. Um, you're seeing them sort of pop up all over the country in livery yards, but also in private um, um, places as well. Um, as a grazing management system, they can provide an exercise regime. They can provide feeding stations for several horses. Um, and um, if there isn't enough grass, they'll often use um, alternative surfaces. They can provide shelter areas, including hedging and trees where horses can browse um, and artificial shelter as well as watering points. They do need to be well managed to prevent the ground being poached and there does need to be enough space uh, for the number of horses using them. They are there to mimic a more natural environment for the horse as well as encouraging movement and exercise by having to sort of move along and search for food and water. And this is this in turn should also mean that your horse is more mentally stimulated as well. Now, we don't all have acres of land to be able to construct a large track system, but it is possible to replicate this in a home uh, or even in a livery yard, obviously asking the owner's permission. Um, to help with the weight loss program, you could build a track with electric fencing and plastic posts inside your paddock or field. You can place your hay nets and your water at different ends so that the horse is encouraged to move about and find it. The middle area can always be used in the winter months and you can change the shape of the track to incorporate this as well um, once your grazing gets too poor. So looking at forage and supplementary feeding, so there's going to be a time during the year that you will potentially need to feed supplementary forage to your horse despite it being on a weight loss programme. So horses have a natural psychological need to chew and it's really important that these natural drives are met to stop any unwanted behaviour such as crib biting or weaving. Fibre takes time to chew and horses in the wild would spend around 75% of their time eating. Uh, when you're working out your horse's daily total feed ration, you want to work on about two to two and a half percent of its ideal body weight. At times, possibly when there's a greater need for weight loss, the ration may be in, reduced to 1.5%, um, but this um, should always be done with your vet's advice and following a strict feeding programme. Working out their ideal weight might be difficult um, when they are overweight, so again, ask your vet for their advice. And feeding supplementary forage can be done in a number of ways, dependent on your situation. So for soaking hay to be effective for weight reduction, as Teresa mentioned before, you need to soak it for um, 12 hours to enable the sugars to be reduced effectively and thereby reducing the calories. Try and look at the quality of your hay you're feeding, as there can be a huge nutritional difference between where it's grown, how it's grown and what it's grown with. Small hold hay nets allow the horse to eat small amounts of hay over longer periods, um, thereby mimicking a more natural approach to trickle feeding. And if you don't like the idea of a horse pulling on a hay net, there are lots of alternatives around on the market nowadays, such as hay balls, hay containers, um, which help manage the amount of forage they're eating, um, and which also can be placed at different heights or on ground level. Again, this will be personal preference and dependent on the number of horses and the type of horses you're feeding. The amount you feed will be broken down to several times a day to ensure your horse's digestive system isn't compromised. Um, if your hay is of a lower quality and it's soaked for over 12, you may be able to feed this ad lib which will also ensure your horse is getting enough fibre, but not gaining the extra weight. Again, this should be done under your vet's guidance. If you're soaking your hay for weight loss, um, there'll be a need to supplement your horse's diet to compensate for the loss of nutrients via the soaking process. There are a broad spectrum of supplements on the market that can be used, and they will replace essential vitamins and minerals. And remember in the hot months, um, it might also be necessary to replace the electrolytes that are lost through sweating. So a salt or mineral block will really be important as well. Um, 
Grazing muzzles can be used. Uh, again, they do need to be fitted correctly and comfortably. They can only be used for sort of 10 to 12 hours a day. And then you've got to watch that your horse isn't then going to gorge on the grass that it goes out onto. So it might be something you have to think about where the horse goes when it's not wearing the grazing muzzle. It might have to come in, it might have to go onto a yard area um, so that you're really watching when they haven't got that muzzle on. Um, they might try and rub it off. And what you have to be careful obviously with grazing muzzles is the grass, grass isn't too short um, that they can't get hold of it or too long where it bends over and they can't get um, hold of the grass either. But there are a huge amount of ranges on the market nowadays. So if we look at exercise for weight loss, um, even if you can't ride, there are often forms of exercise that you can do with your horse. Um, not only is this a great way for the horse to lose weight, it's also a really nice thing to do to form a bit of a bond. So at the centre, we have horses of varying ages, handling, abil uh, handling abilities and future uses. Um, however, this doesn't stop us from doing what we can to not only bring those ponies on with their handling, but also to give them another skill set in the home. So all of our ponies will lead out in hand, whatever age they are, and some of them will learn to lunge and long rein. The youngsters and the non-ridden companions may also be shown some horse agility um, exercises, which again stimulates their mind, but also sets them up for rehoming and the chance to do more of this in the home with a particular emphasis um, to include these skills for weight management um, when it's needed. So obviously there are going to be factors that might not allow you to do some of these exercises, such as safe access to bridleways, any medical issues which may adversely affect your horse, and of course, what you as a handler are confident of doing. But horse agility can be done in the safety of your own premises, and walking in hand and ride and lead are two other options that you can look to for weight loss tools if it's appropriate to do. So to rug or not to rug, and this can quite be quite an interesting topic for people to talk about. Um, horses naturally thermoregulate. So this means that they have the ability to keep a comfortable body temperature um, within certain boundaries, even when the surrounding temperature outside is very different. So this is their thermo neutral range uh, zone. Um, the thermal neutral range of a human is around 25 to 30 degrees C when they're at rest in light clothing. The average horse has a much wider range of between five and 25 degrees C when at rest. So unlike us, on a dry still day, the horse won't feel the cold unless the surrounding temperature drops below five degrees. Um, this can be even lower if you've got a horse with a really, really thick coat. Um, again, it will be dependent on your breed of horse, whether they're clipped or not, um, age and other factors. So how does your horse keep warm? Well, their coat grows ready for winter. Um, this coat consists of two layers, uh, one coarse layer on the top and a downy layer underneath. And um, have you ever seen um, your horse standing in the winter sun with their hair standing on end? Um, it's a bit like sort of goosebumps on humans. They're trapping the warm air between those layers and also when the coat lies flatter, it does stay at an angle, which helps to deflect the rain, um, along with the waterproofing and insulating properties of the skin. The movement keeps your horse warm. So if he's outside in the field moving about, he's more able to maintain a good body temperature than he is standing in the stable. The fibrous forage fed in the winter is like an internal radiator for your horse. So in basic terms, the fermentation process in the horse's digestive system produces heat and that in turn helps to keep your horse warm. Um, wet, windy conditions without shelter will make your horse feel colder, even if the temperature is between 5 and 25 degrees. So with extreme temperatures either way, the elderly, young, thin or fat horse will be less able to cope. So shelter is really important, or if you really need to, rug accordingly, but remember to adapt as soon as the weather changes. Um, the UK weather is notorious for being up and down, so remember one day of wind and rain can quickly turn to winter sunshine. Please don't rug your horse because you're feeling cold. Only rug if they feel cold. You can look for sort of signs like excessive shivering, 
Um, some shivering is a normal body function to reg regulate the temperature, but if they're standing in the corner with their quarters hunched and uh, there's a lack of movement or reluctance to move, then you need to look at potentially popping a rug on the horse. If they have got a rug on, feel under the the rug, um, rather than trying to test things like the ears or the lower limbs. The lower limbs, there's very little blood supply down there, so they always feel fairly cold. Um, and if you have to rug for convenience, because your horse lives out, um, or you work full time, or you've got short daylight hours to, to ride in, then use a thin waterproof sheet unless your horse is clipped out. Most ponies will still live out with rugs comfortably with a clip such as a neck, belly or trace clip um, without a rug on. Um, and clipping can also be used as a weight loss tool as well. And um, all of the horses at our farm, um, bar a handful, live out quite happily all year without a rug on. Um, try and look to have your horse or pony coming out of the winter with a body condition score of 2.5, um, especially if you're working on a weight loss programme ready for the spring. And also if you're limited to what exercise you can achieve at that time of year. Um, we um, also think about our Scottish centre up here at Belwade up in Aberdeen. Their temperatures, because they're on the east coast, um, get really, really cold. It's quite dry, but it's um, cold and um, gets quite snowy and icy. And most of their horses also live out without rugs. Um, occasionally they'll pop a rug onto something that's um, been clipped out, but normally they're using sort of blanket clips or sort of belly clips. Um, so their horses maintain their temperatures quite easily as well. So looking at um, forage, I don't think we can stress enough about the importance of fibre in a horse's diet. And um, in winter, if the grazing is poor, um, feeding will also ensure you don't get problems with digestion, but also remembering it's a fuel to keep your horse warm. A few take care points would be for those people with older horses, horses with poor dentition or fussy feeders, or those that, that are under sort of veterinary care for any reason. Um, these horses uh, may well struggle to receive the required level of good quality fiber in their diet, especially over the winter. So we can help these horses by providing forage replacers such as sort of fiber cubes or high fiber products. And again, many of which can come in low sugar form. So whatever time of year, monitoring your horse's weight as part of your routine is vital. Um, not only for their health, but also looking at things like saddle fit, which can, can be hugely affected by weight gain or loss and then causing unnecessary pain or possible behaviour issues. Um, use the same weigh tape each time so as to ensure continuity. If you do have the luxury of a weigh bridge at your yard or nearby that you can use, that's even better. Um, but do note that it's best to really only use one of those methods as the weights can vary between tape and weigh bridge. Um, we body condition score using the scale of 0 to 5 and always body condition score by feel and not just by looking. Um, and remember there's lots of information on the World Horse Welfare website about body condition scoring and weight taping and there's also the advice line if you've got any questions or queries. So looking at um, the pictures here, many of you may have seen um, Thunder on his story from other webinars but I just wanted to reiterate the need for strict weight management having worked with Thunder firsthand um, in his time at Glenderspooner Farm. He came into us in 2017 um, after one of our field officers was alerted to him. Um, he had been abandoned and he was then living in several paddocks of unrestricted grazing. He was severely overweight with a body condition score of five and he also had long feet, both conditions resulting in early signs of laminitis. He was removed on welfare grounds and brought to Glenderspooner Farm. The difficulty with the start of Thunder's rehabilitation towards weight loss was that he was very foot sore, a direct result of his obesity and his long feet. This limited us to what we could do, and it was quite distressing for him as well as us dealing with him. Thunder was put into one of our sand crew yards so that he wasn't able to eat his bedding and also to provide cushioning for his feet. He was put on a strict daily hay ration, soaked hay, of 1.5% of his ideal body weight, following vet's advice and this was spread throughout the day in small hold hay nets. The farrier was then able to start reducing his foot length but this also caused soreness so again there was a period of limited movement due to this. After a few weeks and when thunder was sound again, 
he began a controlled exercise program with horse walkering and walks in hand. He continued to progress over months um, and gradually the weight came off. Um, he started work towards being ridden or driven um, in the future, which included lunging and long reining, but it took approximately sort of nine months for Thunder to lose the weight and he lost nearly 100 kilograms. So an obese horse's rehabilitation can often take longer than the horse that comes into its underweight if they don't have complications. The major contributing factors related to obesity are um, things like lam laminitis, equine metabolic syndrome, strain on the heart and lungs, um, extra pressure on joints and limbs, and the less, they're less able to perform during exercise. We are seeing more horses with equine metabolic syndrome. It's commonly seen in obese horses, and they are then predisposed to laminitis. And it's a direct result of inappropriate diet and management. So we all know that maintaining the correct weight for many horses and ponies can be a real balancing act. But I hope it's given you a little bit more information about um, what some things you might not have thought of before, or confirm that what you are already doing is okay and most of all allows you to the right, do the right thing by your horse, whatever its size or breed or age. Um, just one important note to finish on, uh, we're not allowed to use the D word, but please don't crash diet an overweight horse, um, as this can serious, have serious and often fatal consequences. So if you're considering um, a weight management program for your horse, um, then always speak to your vet, um, because they'll be best placed to give you advice on how to do this safely. Thank you very much. Sarah, thank you very much indeed. That's been Sarah, I'm going to turn on the light. It's a bit dark now. Um, so we've had a number of questions come in. If you've got any questions, please do uh, put them on the comment section on Facebook or please do um, put them through on Zoom on the chat function or Q&A function. So um, in my, my excitement to introduce <coughs> Dara, I never uh, came back on the poll question. I don't know, Jamie, if you can bring the answer to the poll question. There we go. So most people, um, have never had a soil grass or hay analysis done, but they would like to. And maybe Teresa, Teresa, we could start with that. H how would someone go about doing that? Um, most of the uh, feed manufacturers do offer um, a hay analysis. Um, so I would always start with them. And um, some of them send it away, some do something called wet chemistry. Um, the important thing is, is that you, anal you um, sample your grazing it appropriately. So um, only cut the grass that your horses are eating, not their poo patch obviously. And you should work, walk your field in the W and at each point of the W you cut some of the grass. Um, put that in a plastic bag and the important thing too is to send it on a Monday. Um, seal it really well because you, you don't want to lose too much water out of it because that has an impact on how they actually analyse at the other end. Great. Brilliant, thank you for that. Um, just a question we had beforehand from John. Is, is it best to turn out a good doer on long grass or short grass? And what time of year is the grass sugar content low enough to be safe for good doers? Teresa, what's your thought on those two? Well, that's a, that's a, that's a really good question. And the trouble is, historically, we would say winter's fine, not so much in the summer. But of course, um, I think somebody's already put it on the chat. Their new forests, they um, maintain weight really well last winter because we had grass growing all the time. So um, that's why it's probably quite a good idea to try and get it analysed. Typically, though, um, grass should be generally more nutritious through the spring, slightly less through the summer. You tend to get an autumn flush and then less again in the winter. But it's quantity as well as quality. So it's, the, again, the total amount of sugar, not sugar, calories, sorry, that the horse will eat from the grass. They can get that from a small amount of very nutritious grass, or alternatively, they could eat a lot of slightly lower calorie and get the, the equivalent. So the best way, again, to, to know really is to do that fat scoring on a regular basis so that you see the changes before it's too late, really. So they, <laughs> there, isn't, there isn't actually a straightforward answer, unfortunately. Um, and it's a bit like ourselves. You know, I've got friends that can eat a two-finger Kit Kat every day with their coffee and they don't put on weight. I do, but I'm still eating the same amount of calories as my friends are. 
So it's quite dangerous to think about it. It's -hmm. quite dangerous to think about a safe time to think, oh, well, it's January, so it's safe. Yeah, no, yeah, I think you've got to, you you know, as we all do, use your eyes um, and your hands and and monitor the fat score of the horses on their neck, middle and bottom um, and adjust accordingly. And it may be something you've got to almost do on a weekly basis. Brilliant. Thank you. And so a question from Kath. She's recently bought a horse that was quite overweight. And so she's done a great job, it looks like, on on uh, bringing the weight down. Um, she's asked for advice about how can she now keep that weight off without either restricting too much or allowing the weight to creep back on? What, what, what advice could we give her? Um, I think or is, if it's ex- I don't know if it's exercised or not, if you're able to exercise it. Um, obviously with your grazing management, if you're able to put, put a track in there, so it's a little bit more um, interesting for the horse to move around. Again, it's very individual, um, but if you're able to do something like that, then that might, um, th- that might be something she can use to help keep the weight off um, by using movement, as well as um, sort of keeping the um, calories down with the hay or the grass. Brilliant. Um, we talked quite a lot about soaking, Teresa. Um, <laughs> someone's asked, can haylage be soaked too? No. <laughs> um, basically, we, there's two ways, and I'm sure everyone knows that we can serve grass for when it doesn't grow and isn't available to horses. One is by drying it, which is the hay. The other one is by maintaining it being wet and excluding oxygen so that bacteria um, can ferment, that's already on the grass, can do a healthy fermentation on the grass and effectively pickle it. Um, if we then add water back in, you're upsetting that stable process and then you cause major problems. And that's the other reason why we should also um, make sure our horses eat it within a short period of time. Because again, as soon as you expose it to oxygen, you change that fermentation pattern and then you unstabilize the conservation of the preservation. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, a question about rugging. Can you, um, someone's asked if if you can tell us more about rugging and not rugging and how this relates to weight loss. Um, Well, as I said in the um, presentation that um, if the horse, um, the horse is more likely to move around, I think if it's outside and if it's not got a right, you often see your horses in the winter sort of pinging around and it looks like they're having fun, but most of the time they're running around a little bit to keep warm. Um, So if they can use their natural body temperature to regulate um, rather than putting a rug on and masking that, then they're more likely to lose weight. So I think you sort of look at that thermo um, neutral zone and um, it is going to be individual because obviously every horse is different so I'm not saying every horse can't have a rug on but we have horses from sort of Shetlands through to sort of um, standard bred types that will live out all year long and as long as you're managing your grazing as well um, then most horses will comfortably live quite happily without a rug on um, and by using their natural resources with their bodies they will naturally lose that weight um, along with your grazing management. Right, yeah. Um, I think it's really interesting we rub horses when we don't rub cows or sheep. We have similar coats on, you know. I mean, if we do it because obviously we exercise the horses and they, need to, and they might sweat, but if, it, if we're not able to ride them, I totally concur with Sarah. We, they've got really good coats. And if we put a coat on top of them, then 80% of their feed energy is used to stay warm in the winter. So instead of them keep it, using it up to keep warm, it goes on their back as fat. And then you start the spring with a real nightmare. And Teresa, I know you just gave those comparisons in your, in your presentation just to get, get people to understand what about energy and intake. But it, it is such a problem, isn't it? People are, are anthropomorphic. They, and I think, Sara, you said it, you know, don't put a rug on just because you need to put a coat on. Um, and it, it, it's, it's quite challenging, that, isn't it, to, to get that message across? It is very challenging. I think, and I think, you know, we, I think we're all guilty of it at some point, but I think having worked with so many different horses at the centre now, um, I, I've learned, I've learned a lot over the years. And I truly say we had one of the worst winters last year and probably had a handful of horses that had a rug on and the, most of them that had a rug on it was literally, as I said, about our time constraints with having to work them. So they had a light sheet on, there were four or five horses and that was it. And they all coped. They had, extra hay if they needed it but they all coped they all maintained a weight and some of them still you know we're still struggling a little bit coming out of the winter to keep their weight down so they are okay without rugs on they really are 
brilliant. Thank you. Um, Teresa, a question from Alison. My pony needs a restricted diet to control her weight, along with soaked hay, low calorie chaff, very limited grazing and supplements. I give her ad lib barley straw. Is there a limit to how much her intake should be straw? Well, the work that they did at Edinburgh, which was that paper I shared with you, they were mixing a 50-50 mixture of hay and straw. Um, the work that they did out in Denmark, where they first said that feeding straw was associated with gastric ulcers, I, think, I still feel that it's slightly misleading. And I, I, over the years, and certainly I don't know about Sarah, but we were talking about it um, yesterday. I don't think they do in Somerset, but as you know, up at Hall Farm, they will feed oat straw as the total hay replacer. And I think it's worth remembering too that a lot of our chaffs are made from straw. Okay, we're not feeding massive amounts of them, but the horses have got really good bacteria in their hind gut and they can ferment it as long as it's not wheat straw. So no, feed it as though it's hay, introduce it slowly, make sure, as Sarah said, that um, they're not old and they can chew, all right? I always say keep an eye on fibre length coming through in the horse's droppings. Yeah. If it gets longer than about um, four millimetres, then you know that they're not necessarily processing or fermenting the, the um, straw as well as they should. Uh, but there is, I, I, you know, over the years, loads of people use straw as their total for replacement. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Sarah, you mentioned not to crash diet. Uh, Cass just asked a question about any further explanation what you mean by that, and can you quantify that in terms of kilos on a weekly basis? I'm going to pass that one to Teresa, I think. It's a bit more science-based, <laughs> if that's all right, Teresa. Uh, not a problem. Um, any, any animal that's crushed diet, um, you, will, you, you can get... You, obviously, we all need calories to maintain our um, bodies. And if we crush diet too much, what happens is we break down the fat on our backs really rapidly. And ponies and donkeys can get something called hyperlipidemia, which is where they break the fat off their backs. And, it, and you, you can see a blood example it's, it's yellow rather than red so you have to be quite that's that's an immediate and um not quite so common but it's something you've got to be very aware of and then of course if you cut back too much all the things that both sarah and i mentioned you would get um increased risk of gastric ulcer stereotypy colic um etc etc um so and also if you crash diet of course the horse's body and the same with ourselves goes oh my gosh there's not enough um calories for my brain i need to hang on to it and you become more insulin resistant, which is exactly the opposite of what we're trying to achieve. And I think it was the, that we said about just mimicking, mim mimicking that horse's natural lifestyle, even if you're having to reduce their calories, keep it across that 24 hour period as much as you can, so that we're not taking it or literally taking it all away, definitely. Brilliant. Um, quick question, Teresa, how, how much does it cost to, undertake, to, to have a hay analysis done? Oh, I might land the big companies in it here. When I was at Dodge and Horrell, which was about six years ago, I think it was about oh, 10 to 15 pounds, maybe, for a, what we call the approximate. If you want your minerals done, that is more expensive. But, right. um, I think I'm probably not being unfair. It's around that mark. It's not horrendous. Fine. Okay. And um, a question from Catherine Zara. What is the best regime for using a grazing muzzle? the best regime for using it yes. um what uh regime well i think uh, if you talk if we're talking about fitting it and put introducing it then you need to introduce it to your horse by doing it really slowly sort of putting like you would a bridle put it upside their head make sure they're sort of comfortable with it there and then uh, introduce it slowly over their heads from there and make sure they are comfortable with regards to regime um Again, it's really the length of the grass that you've got um, and monitoring your ponies uh, with it on for a very short time. So you might put it on for half an hour and then see how they cope with it and then gradually increase it from there if they're comfortable with it. Um, and again, just making sure they know where the water is, that they, they can still get to the water and still do the normal things that a horse would do. Um, and, you know, we, we've, we have used them occasionally at the farm, but we have a lot of ponies that um, haven't had a lot of handling. So... If we were to introduce it, it would probably be over quite a long period of time, sort of maybe several weeks to ensure that they were happy with it over the more sensitive areas of their heads. Uh, but I think with regime, um, I think you have to monitor it to start with. So you're actually watching what they're doing and then looking at the amount of grass that they're able to in, sort of take in um, and looking at the length of grass, as I said, not too short or too long there. Um, I don't know if Teresa has any more information on grazing muscles. 
No, I, I agree entirely. The other thing is if you're worried you've restricted too much, um, try and count the poo, because then you'll yeah. know they can't excrete if they haven't eaten. Um, and we did do a little bit of work, never published it, I'm afraid, where we were looking at um, the stress, so cortisol in saliva, on putting on muscles, because I know that's what people worry about. And actually, the, there was no increased um, cortisol with um, horses with muscles on compared to those that didn't. Uh, if, as Sarah says, you introduce it slowly. But they're quite clever, aren't they, these ponies? I convince you that it's torture. <laughs> there is a quick question. Well, you, I think you did mention it. Why not wheat straw? Okay, um, wheat straw, as well as having quite a lot of lignin, which effectively wraps around the bits of fibre that the bacteria can ferment, that stops them fermenting. It also has an awful lot of silica. So basically, you could, the bacteria can't break it down enough and you're more likely to get infection problems and that sort of thing. Whenever I say that, I always get people saying, but my pony eats wheat, it's wheat bedding. Yeah, some do and get away with it, but it's, you know, we can't advise it because of the risk. So. We've got so many questions coming in and we're supposed to finish at quarter past, but we'll go on for another five minutes. Um, uh, question for, uh, for you, uh, I think, Teresa, uh, from Chris. Are there any better times of day to graze ponies with regards to sugar content in the grass? Okay. That, I appreciate I was a bit fast towards the end, but that graph I put up, um, which, showed, which I just referred you to the hay at the bottom with blue, what it was also showing was the fluctuation in sugars within the grass during the day and then the horse's insulin response in red. And basically, we <laughs> have to go back to biology, um, grasses make sugar when there's warmth, water and sunlight photosynthesis. So it needs a period of that before it starts to form the sugars. So normally sugar will be at its, and then they start growing and using it up. So the best time is in fact um, either early morning before it started photosynthesizing um, or night times when it's used up the sugar during the day. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, if, sugar is important, but it's the total, as Sarah's been saying, it's the total calories they're eating from it that's really the crucial to, thing to worry about. Brilliant. Um, Sarah, to aid in weight management, is it most time effective to exercise under saddle or to lunge? And how long should you do those? Um, I think with... I think that is really dependent on the horse. I think um, lunging, you have got to get their heart rate up enough. I think it's over 80, 80 to 80, I think 80 beats per minute, um, which is quite hard on a horse. So it, I think with something that's not exercised before, or um, I think you have to think about how you're going to do that. Um, I think it's, I think it's really individual. It can work for say horses, for instance, that some of them that we have that aren't at the ridden stage or can't be ridden for any reason. If they're sound enough, they can lunge, but they need to get that heart rate up. Um, obviously, if you can ride for exercise, you can work on like a fitting program, which you would for a human that you can with a horse as well. So I think it's quite individual um, and it would be individual for the horse um, on what they can do. Um, our, both of them work because we use both of them at the centre. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. So many questions are coming through. A question, Zara. Um, body condition scoring may not be o someone who body condition scores, um, but has a large fiber belly. Would this be exacerbated by feeding straw? Um, I think it possibly could. I mean, Teresa might be answer that more because we don't feed straw, but obviously you see the grass belly mm. sometimes on a horse. So I imagine it's the same thing. Um, but this is where obviously your body condition scoring, your weight tape might be different when you have a horse that's fluctuating there. But by body condition scoring by feel, you're going to get much more of an idea of where your horse at with, is with regard to the scale and also its weight management by feeling the different areas um, than just putting a tape around it. Absolutely. Because if people remember, we don't fat score under the belly, we fat no. score on the ribs. And think about where your horse's stomach is. It's tucked up under the rib it's not underneath so you're right that that sort of bulk um the size is likely the grass belly that's water with straw it's 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 fiber sitting there waiting to be fermented effectively brilliant we are, we are going to have to draw to a close but i just thought i'd pick up on a you you start an interesting discussion teresa around if people are happy to have their horses lose weight over the winter and teresa's come up with a a, a, a sort of a, a a case study here or an experience you know and she has a real problem 
um, for people on her yard because people th think the fat horse is the normal horse that they um, she has real problems but she's been called cruel for muzzling and restricting her her mare's um, uh, grazing I mean what 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 advice and support can can, can we give give her have faith <laughs> keep the faith no you are you know what you're doing is right and it is it I had a student do some work on this. It's called normalization. Um, and you do, it's, you've only got to look at the show world, don't you, and everything else. And, and a well-rounded horse looks normal to us now and it shouldn't do. So no, stay strong and um, try and find people that understand what you're doing and get them to support you. Don't, don't be pulled around by others that perhaps aren't quite so knowledgeable as you. Yes, I mean, it is a real collective effort, isn't it, for us, as you say, to stay strong, because we do have to change people's normal back to, to realign to what really is normal and not what um, we've sort of got used to. Teresa, listen, we've had so many questions. I would say to everyone, if we haven't answered your question, then please do pop it on an email to education at worldhorsewelfare.org, and then between Teresa and Zara, we'll make sure that those questions are answered. Um, Teresa, we've had a fascinating discussion. What What... Sort of final thought from you take home message i know you warned us but there's been so many questions and not i think um yeah stay supportive of each other and seriously um the reason i call it fat scoring rather than condition scoring is, is if we're not riding our horses through the winter which we're not often able to we need to have confidence to lose that fat so that during the summer when they put it back on again we know we're not killing them from the inside out so yeah just support each other and find forums that understand what you're doing and and, and stick with it it's going to take a while but stick with it yeah, absolutely thank you Teresa. Uh, Sarah what final thought from you um I think similar is don't give up you know keep keep trying there, there's so many so much information out there now and there's so many resources and there's people that you can talk to with regard to managing weight i know we know it can be frustrating and you know, we have those types of ponies but it's not a short-term fix it's long term you've got to keep at it and you will get there definitely brilliant listen sarah and Teresa, thank you so much for your presentations and, and fielding so many questions thank you to everyone who's joined us on zoom and on facebook live for all your questions as i say if we haven't answered them then please do send them through to us at education at worldhorsewelfare.org if you have any suggestions about what we might do um, for future webinars then please also send that through to education at worldhorsewelfare.org and then please don't forget we record all of these webinars um, and so please do come back or share them with your friends um, if you have found them useful as i say this is the second one we've done on managing weight we will certainly do at least another around the poor doer and probably more but any other suggestions please let us know thank you so much for joining us once again i hope you have a wonderful evening um, and take care in this ex um, hopefully uh, slightly improving world we're living in um, and um, in, enjoy your horses and we look forward to seeing you in a fortnight's time.